every day good quality jobs are being destroyed by automation and replaced by uberized jobs you know mini jobs and all that and none of the establishment parties have a solution to this Welcome to our studio, Mr. Valofakis. Thank you for having me at Multikulti. Yeah, thank you. Um, everybody knows you from your time as Greek Minister of Finances, and uh, but I guess very few people know what happened before. So could you say just briefly what happened in your life before you became the minister? Well, for about 25, 30 years, I was a professor of economics uh, all over the world. You studied in England. I huh? studied in England. I taught in England. Then I taught in Australia. I taught in Belgium, um, and then I taught in the United States, uh, and then the economic collapse of Greece found me at the University of Athens, and I became notorious because I started saying from 2009 that the Greek state was insolvent, bankrupt, and the worst thing we could ever do is to get a huge loan by which to pretend that we were not bankrupt. So that uh, made headlines. and. Um, It but began, nobody listened to you then. Uh, a lot of people listened, but the oligarchy, both in Athens and in Europe, had a vested interest in covering up the bankruptcy of the Greek state in order to cover up the bankruptcy of Deutsche Bank, of Commerzbank, yeah. of Societe Generale, and so on. So there was a huge cynical transfer of losses, bank losses, from those banks onto the shoulders of taxpayers, of voters, here in Germany, in Greece, in Slovenia, everywhere. And you know, once I started speaking up about that, I gained a degree of notoriety uh, or prominence, depending <laughs> on your point of view. And before I knew it, I was dragged into the political scene. And without wishing to do it, I ended up being the finance minister. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was always a bit, uh, how can I say it, puzzled by the fact that, I mean, uh, everybody said, okay, the Greeks, they, they took so many loans and now they are not able to pay them back. But nobody's actually said, hey, uh, what happened to the banks who gave those loans and who should have actually known that Greece wouldn't be able to pay back? Wouldn't it be their responsibility to stand in for it and, t and, and take the loss? You're quite right. For every irresponsible borrower, there is an irresponsible banker. Uh, it takes two to tango, of as, course. The, as they yeah. say. <laughs> But look, let, let me let me um, answer this question a little bit more precisely by means of uh, a, a story, if I can, if yeah, we yeah, have yeah. the time. Uh, in 2011, I was flying from Frankfurt Airport to New York City. Uh, Lufthansa, I remember the flight. And I was sitting next to a German former banker. His name was Franz. I'll just identify mm. him with his first name. And he told me his story. And it's a story of Greece and Germany and Europe. And to cut a long story short, he, he resigned uh, in his position in around 2008, 2009, because of the stress that he felt as a German banker after the creation of the euro. And I said to him, why? He said, listen, before the euro, I was a king of my own realm. I would, his job was to go to places like Athens, Madrid, Dublin, uh, as a banker. And he would meet government officials, local bankers, industrialists, and they would all uh, beg for money, for loans, and present business models, and then they would take him to the opera house, they would take him to nice restaurants, and then he would come back to Frankfurt, and there he would decide who was going to get money and who would not. But he said, after the creation of the euro, HQ, headquarters and from Frankfurt, from his, his bank, uh, were giving him a huge uh, quota of money that he would have to lend every week. So he would have to lend billions every week. So, so he, he had to search for people that he, he could give. So he would have to go to Athens, to Dublin, to Madrid, and beg people there to take, take the money. money. <laughs> and of course, this is because of the construction of the euro. So, and it, it makes perfect sense if you think about it, because the euro yeah. locked our currencies together. So suddenly, every Volkswagen that gets sold in uh, in Greece uh, yeah. brings euros back to Frankfurt. And so then what, Frankfurt has these euros, and they need to lend it to someone. The Germans didn't have demand yeah. for that money, there, so they had to take it out. So, so from your point of view, what should have been made different? 
I mean, of course, I think generally we could say that it was actually, uh, it is, I think, quite a silly idea to introduce the euro without having a common um, financial and, and, and social and, and economic policy. This is exactly zone. right. And the regulatory regime. Yeah. So, uh, the, summing up what you said, the idea of having one currency but separate banking systems and the supervision of the Greek banks was a Greek matter and of German banks was a German matter, when you know that when banks collapse, the Greek state cannot look after the Greek banks and indeed the German state cannot even look after the German banks. Huh? Yeah. And then you will have to start extending the crisis to the future by pre and pretending you solved it by means of bailouts that you, imp imp you, you, you impose upon yeah. the taxpayers. So it was a disaster in the making. It was a designed disaster. Yeah. But I, I remember I once had here the, maybe you know her, the political scientist Ulrike Giro. I know her, she's a friend. Yeah, uh, and she said that um, actually, well, one of the forces behind the introduction of the euro was Helmut Kohl, who wasn't an economist, of course. Um, but uh, he said people like Kohl thought or hoped that the introduction of the euro would... Um, kind of enforce this common uh, regulatory policies and finance policies. Yeah, that was and, a big mistake, wasn't it? And, and that wasn't obviously an illusion. Well, you see, um, well, firstly, let's be kind to Helmut Kohl. It was not a German idea, it was a French idea. Okay, uh, but he jumped uh, well, he was he was convinced European, so to speak. Uh, yeah, we are all uh, convinced European. Yeah. I'm a convinced European, yeah, I'm of sure course. you are. Oh. But that doesn't mean we should make no, no, gross, I mean, gross that, mistakes that's on behalf of Europe. We should to but credit the, him for, the, you know? the pressure uh, for common currency was French. Okay. Uh, let me tell you something you probably don't know. In April 1964, uh, Giscard d'Estaing, who later became president of the French Republic, back then he was the finance minister of Charles de Gaulle. Okay. Nine, April 1964, he takes an airplane from Paris and uh, ends, up, ends up in Bonn. And there he meets the, his, his German counterpart. Because Adenauer was still... Oh. No, no, Erhard was... Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Erhard was, was gone was still already. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, no, Erhard was Minister of Finances. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Uh, no, um, actually, Erhard at the time had become the, the chancellor, chancellor already. Uh, okay. And there was another... I can't remember the name of the... Oh, anyway. I'll remember the name of the... Anyway, the fact is that Giscard d'Estaing demanded a monetary union with, with, with Germany within a few months. So the pressure... It was always coming from France, and Germany was always mm. trying to push back. Well, what do you think was the reason? Well, the reason was that... You, you didn't want Germany to become too strong, or...? Well, uh, allow me to be vulgar uh, 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 and precise at the same time. Uh, for, the, for, the, for Germans, for most Germans, and the political class in Germany after the Second World War, uh, they, uh, the, the, the vision was one where Germany loses itself within the European Union. Uh, but for France, it was always a Napoleonic project of taking over the Bundesbank oh, okay. in order to impose f a French model uh, across Europe. All right. Uh, and I mit, know mit they, they, also, they also blocked uh, the British coming into the uh, European Union for, for quite a few years. Well, yes, maybe yeah. they were right about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at Brexit now, for yeah. instance. But you're right. It was, it was also part of the plan of dominating the Franco-German axis. Uh, but look, we are, yeah. th this is a very interesting conversation. But coming to our time, uh, the contract the silent contract between Paris and Berlin uh, since the years of Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand was uh, we are going to create this monetary union uh, and uh, Mitterrand had actually said that to a friend of mine in person back then who prognosticated that it would be a major crisis like the one we had he said that's fine because when the crisis come our successors the successors mm -hmm. of Helmut Kohl and yeah. I mean, François Mitterrand would fix it and would create all the institutions, it didn't happen. And yeah. the, it could not happen, think about it. Because the moment the crisis hits, we have centrifugal forces tearing up the union. So every, everybody wants to renationalize policy. The FDP, even the SPD says, no, 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 we are not going to mutualize debts, banks, this, that. So they're moving away from the federation that was necessary to support the monetary union, even though they still want the monetary union. This is a, the madness of our European yeah. Union today.
Yeah, but I mean, of course, there are also people who say, well, uh, I, 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 I think in, in, in your book you say that uh, Schäuble wanted Greek, uh, Greece to leave the, the, um, sure. the uh, currency union yeah. temporarily. Not temporarily, that's what oh. he said. Um, that was his yeah. tactic. Oh. You, don't, you never leave temporarily. If you leave, you leave. Yeah, but What's I mean, the point of uh, coming back? I, I remember <laughs> someone used that, that nice metaphor. He <laughs> said, uh, take an omelette and try to get the single X out of it again. Yeah. So it, it, I think from my point of view, I think it, 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 it would be practically impossible to do that it would be it wouldn't be impossible uh it would be costly yeah well it was, would be a disaster actually uh, that's what i said to yeah. Schäuble when he said to me i said this is a very anti-european you think you can control the shock waves that you can and he contain thought he them? could yes he thought he could he thought that together with the european central bank they could um cauterize the the wound of greece and stop the bleeding but If you look at Italy today, you can see that, uh, in, in my estimation, a Grexit, a Greece's yeah. exit from the yeah. EU, you could cost about a trillion euros to the rest of the Eurozone. Uh, and th that would, would, would start a domino effect because the markets could immediately start betting on who is next. Yeah, of and course. That, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is why I never believed the threat that um, I was uh, and my government was uh, receiving that if you don't sign on the dotted line, we will throw you out of the euro. I thought it was an empty threat. Schäuble believed it. But Merkel. But also, he is not an economist. Uh, yes, yeah. he's not an economist, and he's very proud of not being an economist. Yeah. What you need to understand about Volkan Schäuble mm. is that strategically he chooses not to understand economics. For him, it's not a failure not to understand economics. Okay. It is important to not understand macroeconomics, not to pay attention to macroeconomics in order to use the position of the finance minister uh, as a political control exercise. Uh -huh. It's, it, to me, it sounds like a pretty bizarre position. It's not uh, bizarre. Because for, for Schäuble, Schäuble, is, you have to remember, he's the last of the older generation yeah. who always saw the monetary union as a tussle between France and Germany. He always could see what I said before, yeah. and he was right in that that, that, that the French elite simply wanted to take over the Deutsche Bank. Okay. And for Schäuble, it was always, you know, you want to be, you want a real federation? Okay, dissolve your national parliament, we dissolve ours, let's have a common one. So he was a Europeanist in that sense. Okay. The, the French wanted to maintain yeah. national sovereignty and get their hands on the Deutschmark. So for Schäuble, this was simply not on. And if he, his plan in 2015, which Merkel did not agree with, was to get Greece out of the euro in order to, and help us recover, mm. um, while at the same time signaling to the French, you want the Deutschmark, you have to cede control of your budget to me. From okay. that perspective, it's not bizarre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, 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 you know, it's geopolitics through the finance ministry. Yeah, but on the other hand, I remember I re, uh, in, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, he once wrote an article and he said, well, actually, I never understood why the German export surplus should be a problem for other countries. And I thought, hä? A six-year-old child can see that. Uh, but obviously, uh, if you say he, he chose purposely not to understand macroeconomics, then it makes sense. You know? Well, but th think yeah. about it. The, uh, ev since the days of Kaiser, the business model of Germany was always one of export orientation. That's not a bad of thing in itself. Of net export orientation. Yeah, okay. Of net export orientation, yeah. sorry. And, and, and that was made possible by the United States after the Second World War, because the United States created the Bretton Woods system, yeah. which allowed the, Germany... International Monetary Fund and World Bank. Uh, yes, and, uh, and the, uh, fixed exchange rates. Yeah. So effectively, they gave you here in Germany a fixed exchange rate with a dollar, with a French franc, with a British pound, the yen. Uh, well, and in that West Germany, yeah. Yes, <laughs> indeed. And that allowed West Germany uh, to grow on the basis of net exports. So that was sustainable as long as Mother America was looking after the shop, the international shop, and Germany could pretend to be a workshop, a factory. A factory is always uh, yeah. in surplus. <laughs> it exports, yeah. a factory exports a lot more than it imports, you know, the food for yeah. the workers and the coffee, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that ended in 1971, and since then, all the trials and tribulations of Europe well, the free are the result of the fact that Germany is you know. refusing to play a hegemonic role. 
Yeah, but I mean, I, I think also it's, it, again, it's a lack of, of macroeconomic understanding. In Germany, there's a phrase of the so-called Swabian housewife. Yeah, and uh, I'm you know about that, familiar guess. with the Swabian uh, housewife. And, and uh, so... And, and and she would never spend more money than is in the family budget. And of course, she tries to save money. So And still people think also, if we as a country earn more money by exporting things that we spend on importing, that's a great thing. Mm, until you start asking further questions. Yeah, of course, yeah. because uh, to enable our partners to buy our products, we have to give them loans. Indeed. Uh, and, and think about it, if you... And if they can't back, then in the, the end we gave them the products now, for nothing. The paradox, of the, the paradox of Germany now is that you've got four surpluses. You have a trade surplus, you have a federal government budget surplus, you have the Swabian housewife that is in surplus, and you have corporations that are in surplus. Now, the, 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 when everybody is in surplus, who is in deficit? So it must be the foreigners. So effectively, and the, 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 Swabians, the Swabian housewives' savings, by definition, have to be given to foreigners. Of course. So effectively, you have to entrust your savings to the foreigners. Not so very clever. No, of course not. <laughs> Because But the foreigners may lose it, may create yeah. bubbles, may waste it. And then you give them uh, your exports they for nothing. Or they have a devaluation, yeah. and then you lose it. Uh, look, let me put it this way. Uh, if you look, if you take the, if you accumulate all the surpluses that Germany made since the creation of the euro in 2000, uh, uh, you find that today about 700 to 800 billion of it is missing. It's been wasted. It's gone. Yeah. Because it has been given to foreigners who lost it, either through bankruptcy or through crisis or through whatever. Uh, so net exports is not a good idea and having the, yeah. increasing exports yeah. as long as you're increasing imports is a That's good thing fine. yeah of course but but this net export was also um uh reached actually on the expense of employees uh who accepted uh well very few wage increases exactly At this so the they, they, they of, lost of, of on the, that of side of the german working class yeah So, but you, you see, this is why you have this great paradox I was referring to before. You have a country that is drowning in money, and yet 50% of the population, half of the population, are worse off today than they were 20 years ago. Yeah. That is a crime against logic. And this is why our party, allow me a pitch here, Democratie in Europa, is running on the basis of a European New Deal. Because what the people of Germany need is a sensible, rational reconfiguration of our policy, economic policy, social policy, financial policy, banking policy across Europe. Uh, it is in, you see, we, the, the greatest uh, uh, threat to the average German, to the average French person, the average Greek person, is this crazy notion that this is a zero-sum game, that what the Germans gain, the others have to lose or what others gain, the Germans have to lose, and the Germans will have to pay for others. That is not the case. The Germans yeah. are paying today for this paradox. Of course, and um, but I mean, actually, it's not so difficult to see. Why do you think so many politicians still look at macroeconomics with the, uh, from the perspective of the Swabian housewife? Well, the Swabian housewife is, the, is, is very badly injured by the policies that these politicians have been pursuing because yeah. now her pension fund is shrinking because there are negative interest rates. And there are negative interest rates because of the failure of German politicians, Greek politicians, French politicians, I don't blame it just on the Germans. No, no, of course uh, not. To, 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 to rationalize economic policy. Uh, but allow me to answer your question a bit more directly. Political parties and politicians are largely funded by the oligarchy in every country, not just in Germany. The Frankfurt-based banks are bankrupt. Deutsche Bank is in a terrible mess, has been since 2008. It is now being forced, more or less, to merge with Commerzbank. It is in a terrible state. But then we will have an even bigger bank. Yeah, I know. Which, which is uh, even more, even, even as they call it, system hole. relevant. Indeed, it's not going to solve, solve the problem. But what I'm saying is this. Politicians, unfortunately, have been financed by bankers, political parties, even the SPD. The SPD mm. sold its soul to the financial sector 20 years ago. Uh, and therefore, the interests of the few have a disproportionate influence in political, in political narratives. And there is also another uh, issue, herd behavior. 
sheep-like behavior. One politician mm-hmm. following the other. None of them uh, feel that they can afford to step out of line, okay. to say something that is not, that, that jars, not that, that creates dissonance yeah. with, uh, the, with the mainstream. Uh, but that's something we need to break down. And you know what? The only way of breaking the, this down is through transnational politics. This is why I keep insisting that I come back to the fact that we have a European Parliament election this coming May, and the fact that I'm here as a um, representative of Democracy in Europa, running in yes. Germany for the European Parliament elections as a candidate here in Germany, while we have a colleague of ours who is German, Jochen Schult, running in Greece. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> in order to signal yeah. that uh, we must stop thinking as Germans and we must stop well, thinking I, as the Greeks. I mean, I think and we have to stop yeah. thinking as rational Europeans. We, we, we have this bizarre situation that we have a European Parliament, we, we elect a European Parliament, but we have to vote for national parties, except yours. That's right. Uh, and uh, we have to vote for national candidates. That's um, right. And we we don't vote elect a parliament uh, according to the principle of one man one vote yeah um and, and we par- don't have a european program and, 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 this is why yeah, and, our and, party and, democratic yeah, europe and, is, is insisting on a european program and, and we we don't have a parliament that has actually something to say yeah it's not a real parliament Let's, yeah. let me put so, it this and in, so, in this way uh, so and i'm i remember i was shocked when at the last uh, um European election campaign, I saw a poster by the SPD with Martin Schulz saying something like, vote SPD so that the German will become the president of the commission. <laughs> and I thought, I give a shit where the president of the commission comes from as Indeed. long as he or she makes a good job. Indeed. You, see, job. This is, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we have to uh, Europeanize European politics. Because at the moment, political parties, all political parties, treat the European Parliament elections as an opinion poll for the national election and also as a way of getting some people to Brussels to have the salary and the perks that come with the yeah. job. But nobody really looks at the European Parliament elections as an opportunity to put to people across Europe the same agenda on what needs to happen in Europe. And this is a tragedy because our problems are European. They're not German, they're not Greek, they're not French. It's a systemic crisis and we have no systematic approach to it. When the crisis started in Greece, it was treated like a Greek public debt crisis. It was not. It was a crisis as much of the Greek state as it was of Deutsche Bank. And then they moved on to the Irish banks and then they they looked at the, the case. Now they're talking about the Italian public debt. But nobody's talking about the causes of those symptoms. These are all symptoms. You know, if you're a doctor mm. and you only treat the symptoms and, and, and not the cause of the disease, you, you're disbarred, you're thrown yeah. out by yeah. the medical association. Uh, in, in Europe, they should all be thrown out. This is why we insist on having one program for Europe, we call it the, the Green New Deal for Europe, and one um, political vehicle, this is the European Spring, under which Democracy in Europa runs. We don't have the monopoly of the truth, but at least we have tried to have one list across Europe and one policy agenda that we are inviting voters, uh, citizens, to look at and tell us where we're wrong. Tell me a little bit about how did you get the idea to start your own political movement and, and how did it materialize then? When I resigned uh, the finance ministry in July of 2015, that was a major defeat uh, for all of those of us who fought against the the Troika and the perpetuation of the crisis. And I remember I was uh, deflated, psychologically deflated. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, There was a lot of pressure on me to create a Greek political party to start again, and I just couldn't do it. Uh, And a a few weeks later, I found myself in a small village somewhere in France. And I was told to give to, to address a public meeting of some like 200 people, and 5,000 people came. And suddenly I realized that they were not there for me. They were worried about what was going on in France because they could see, they could sense, they could feel that what started in Greece would go their way. And look now what's happening in France with the Gilets and so on. A week later, I was here in Berlin at the Volksbühne Theater, and I realized the same thing. I had 1,000 people in the Volksbühne Theater, and They were not there just to talk about Greece. They were there to talk about their concerns about Europe. And then a day later, I was at Malberg University, and I had 1,500 people in a small town. I know, yeah. And I realized that 
this is a European issue, and we cannot sort it out as Greeks, as Germans, as French. So th I mentioned this to a friend of mine, Sreczko Horvath, who was with me at the time, that, you know, if we're going to do anything, we we better invest all our energies in creating a pan-European democratic movement. And the next day he called me, he said, I, I booked the Volksbühne for the 9th February 2016. So we start. So I thought, well, that's crazy. Here we are, two idiots, right? <laughs> on our own, no funds. So actually it was started in Berlin? It started in Berlin on the 9th of February 2016. The Demokratie in Europa yeah. movement began here as DiEM25, the Democracy in Europe movement, as Kappa Diem. Um, and we've been uh, growing strong ever since. Most of our members were in Germany initially. Now we have more than 100,000 members across Europe. And we're going to run everywhere, in Spain, in Portugal, in Denmark, in Poland. Um, in Poland? Yes, indeed. Our comrades there, the, 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 a small party led by two wonderful women called Razum, together, uh, are part of our European Spring Diem movement. So you have kind of independent organizations all over Europe, and, and you are the kind of umbrella organization? Or, We invited uh, all progressives oh, okay. to, to, to join us in writing together the manifesto, the New Deal yeah. for Europe. And lots of parties came uh, from across Europe, and in other places where no party came, we created our own, like here in Germany, okay. Democratia in Europa, or like in Greece, Mera 25. Um, in Spain, there is a, a party that uh, the great judge, Batazar Garzon, the guy who um, went after Pinochet, yeah, yeah. set up, yeah, yeah. and they joined uh, our movement, uh, Livre in Portugal, the Alternative Party, the Alternative in Denmark, which is an established, it's effectively the Green Party of yeah. Denmark, joined. Um, What I can guarantee you is that we're having lots of fun. <laughs> uh, because it's important, you know, to have fun in politics yeah, and course. not have backstabbing. We're not professional politicians. And if we ever become professional politicians, don't speak to us again. No, and, 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 and why not having fun? I mean, I remember in, in the late 80s, I was in London and I visited the office of the anti-apartment movement. Uh, uh, anti-apartheid movement and they had a, a brochure called fundraising is fun well, uh, i think fun fun is revolutionary yeah as so long as it is not epidermic that goes and, deep and nothing can kill um but um actually here in germany i would have thought like either the greens or the linke to cooperate with you but wh why didn't it work out well uh we still hope that we do we will cooperate with them uh At the Volksbühne Theater in February 2016, we invited them. So Katja Keeping, great comrade yeah. and friend from the Linke, came and joined. Their headquarters just across the road. Yeah, yeah. And, and we are great friends and comrades. They okay. came. And some of the Greens came as well. But let me say this in response. After a year, a year and a half of working, working together on our New Deal for Europe, the program, we realized that they were constrained by their bureaucratic machinery within their parties. Okay. So they would endorse the European New Deal, but then they would not run with it. They would not push it because they... So, for instance, as you know, the Linke is split between the Europhiles and the Eurosceptics. So they could not agree on mm. running with our okay. European New Deal. Uh, And, and what we as Democratia in Europa believe is that the tragedy of the left and of the Greens is that because they put above all else unity and maintaining their bureaucratic machinery, they end up not having a program that can appeal to people because in order to have a common program, you know, for Sarah and Katia yeah. to have the, the common program, the common program must be meaningless because they don't agree on yeah, much. Yeah. And then History, on the other hand, history we, bypasses them. We all know that that left groups uh, enjoy fighting each other. You know, so, that's right. But uh, we don't. You see, yeah. and we we are so bathing remember them. Remember the life of Brian. Oh, of uh, course, <laughs> like, I keep mentioning that. Uh, but we keep bathing them with solidarity yeah. and love. We will never criticize either the Greens or the left. Mm. Uh, we will never attack them. We want to have uh, cooperation with them. But at the same time, we feel the need to run across Europe, from Denmark to Portugal, from Ireland to Greece, in Germany, in France, in Italy, with the same agenda that is coherent, because unity is not enough. You need unity and you need coherence, because people out there don't give a damn about political parties. They want answers to the question, okay, so how are you going to create good quality jobs? Yeah. How are you going to pay for the green transition? Tell us specifically, what are you going to do on Monday morning? As Democracy in Europa, we have an answer. If we were going to have an alliance with Sarah, with the Greens and so on, we wouldn't have an answer because they wouldn't agree. Hmm. So at least we have 
clarity. Uh, that that's a good point. Um, Uh, let's. You were talking about the Green New Deal. Of course, mm -hmm. the New Deal is referring to Roosevelt and to the United Indeed. States in the 1930s, which was mainly an economic issue, uh, I would say. Um, but um, uh, of course, these days we need an ecological mm -hmm. component as well. But let's speak a bit more about the program of of DM 25. What are your main points? Okay, to make to keep it simple, three numbers: 500, 100, and three. Can it be more specific than that? <laughs> 500. What's a 500? 500 billion euros to be spent on green energy, green transport, and green transition in industry, especially car making here in this country, and agriculture. 500 billion every year. Every year. 500 billion. Where does this money come from? It can't come from taxation because our states are fiscally stressed. The European Investment Bank, which belongs to all of us, it belongs to the Germans, to the Greeks, to the French, eh? issues... 500 billion euros worth I mean, of bonds. Actually, the European Central Bank can create the money out of nothing. Yeah, but no, no, they cannot. The European Central Bank, the charter was written by the Buddhist Bank. It stopped them from doing it. Oh, okay. But the European Investment Bank, this is why, you see, we're, tra we're trying, to be, trying to be pragmatic. Yeah. I don't like the way that the ECB was set up, but I, I'm not going to argue with them now. This is how it is. So we need answers as to what can happen within the existing rules on Monday mm. morning. I may not like the rules, but these are the rules. Yeah. You see, I'm becoming very German. So, uh, but the EIB, European Investment Bank, can issue 500 billion okay. worth of bonds every year. And the ECB, the European Central Bank, can make an announcement that if the interest rates of these bonds or the price of those bonds goes, if the price goes down or the interest rates go up, it will buy them yeah. secondhand, as it is already doing. Yeah, of course. Okay? Yeah. That immediately will mean that the ECB will not have to buy them because everybody has... The Schwabian housewife that we mentioned before doesn't have anywhere to invest her money now uh, because wherever she invests it, negative interest rates or yeah. zero interest rates. But yeah. the EIB bonds are safe, especially if the ECB is behind them. So this is where we get 500 billion hmm, to invest in the green transition every year. We have a major fund. Okay, so that's a 500. Then I said 100, remember? 500, yeah. 103, 100. 100 billion we need to spend every, every year in Europe to fight poverty. In East Germany, in the suburbs of Berlin, in Portugal, in Greece, everywhere. Of course. Where will the money come from? Again, not from taxation. Do you know that last year the European Central Bank had a profit of 91 billion? No. From yeah. all the purchases that yeah, it yeah. makes, part of the quantitative easing project, part of Target 2, senior mm. edge, and so on. The central bank shouldn't have profits. It's, no. it's a public bank. Uh, and what happens now is that money goes back to the treasuries of the different states oh, in okay. proportion to their size. So the German treasury well, gets okay. the most. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why should the German treasury get this money? This money is European money generated by the euro itself. Well, it's just a decision of the European Union Council that to create an anti-poverty fighting fund, and it goes in there. Imagine the beauty. I mean, what, what exactly should be done with the money? It's very simple. You identify poor families across Europe, and they receive a check every month signed by the president of the European Central Bank, and they can use it in order to buy food and basic commodities from supermarkets, pay for electricity, transport, and so on. This is what happens in the United States, the food stamps. And do you know, in the United States, when a poor family in Missouri and another poor family in California, they receive this check signed by the president of the Fed, the chairman of the mm -hmm. Fed, that makes them feel American. It, it's unifying. It will be a remarkable unifying uh, move for a poor family in Germany and a poor family in Greece to, to receive the same check signed, signed by the ECB. Signed by the ECB. Oh, okay. Yeah? So that's a 100. It, 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 do you think this is, could be, become something like a basic income? No, no so this is not a basic something, income. Something we else, have so. a plan for basic income, okay. but that is to fight poverty. Okay. It goes, yeah. It's targeted to the poor families. And it's very easy to do this yeah. through the social welfare systems that we already have. Yeah. So, okay, that's the 100. Another three. The three is three trillion. Uh, and this con concerns public debt. Everybody talks about public debt having spiraled away into the universe. Sure, the Eurozone has a public debt of a bit more than 9 trillion. We should have, according to the rules, 6 trillion. Okay, so this 3 trillion has to go. And we have a very clear, a very straightforward technical proposal of how this can be done. It involves the European Central Bank. You take the, the debt of every country, Greece, Italy, Germany, and you split it into two parts. The part that we, we were allowed to have, 
the permissible part, 60% of total income, and the rest. And the European Central Bank helps our governments service the good part, the permissible part, mm. not the other one. Uh, the other one, you, you shouldn't have it, you deal with it on your own. Uh, and how does the CECB do that? It mediates between governments and investors. And effectively, it, it, it offers an insurance to investors that this part, it will be repaid even if the ECB has to cover it. But it will not cover it. It will be Italy, it will be Greece, it will be Germany, mm. but at a very low interest rate, near zero. So if you reduce interest rates for 60% of total Eurozone income in terms of public debt by 1%, then suddenly you've wiped out 3 trillion euros worth of debt repayments over the next 20 years. So that makes the debt crisis go away uh, and without anybody losing money. So these are, if you want, the first things we, sh we should do according to democracy in Europa, and we can do them within existing rules, and that will change the atmosphere, the climate. Just this announcement will suddenly present the European Union in the eyes of the Swabian housewife, the Greek equivalent, the Portuguese equivalent, as a source of solutions, as a source of hope. And then we can have the discussion amongst ourselves of what kind of democratic constitution we want uh, in order to have a, a proper mm. democratic European Union. So this is our program for May 2019, the European Parliament, Parliament elections, because we believe that we have to have concrete proposals that are both practical and visionary. But I guess these plans would um, uh, violate, so to speak, some influential interests of lobbies. Not so much, you know, uh, because nobody loses from what I've just said. Uh, it yeah, but then you have to convince the people of that. Indeed. Indeed, uh, it, it, what, what will, I'll tell you who is going to be threatened. Those people who created their careers in Brussels, in Frankfurt, in Berlin, on the basis of a very strict austerity, where the policies that they are pursuing give them enormous personal power. Yeah. So the, the man from the ECB that goes to Greece and demands that pensions be, will be, should be cut, that uh, houses Health should be sold off, right? yeah, this yeah. person has a whole career built on this harshness. Huh? And this person doesn't like anything that changes the complexion, the atmosphere in Europe. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, the Chancellor of Germany, doesn't, not necessarily Merkel, looks at proposals like that with a great deal of skepticism for one reason. The reason why when there is a European Union summit today, the German Chancellor walks in and the French President doesn't speak is because of the fear on the French side that the German side can simply move out of the Eurozone. Not that Germany wants to get out of the Eurozone, but it can get out of the Eurozone and that will destroy France because it's a deficit country. If, if, if the, the euro breaks up now, yeah, but, uh, but France if, is destroyed. If Germany leaves the eurozone, would return to the uh, Deutsche Mark. It will be it, costly, but it will not yeah. be. It will not be catastrophic. Because, because the, what, the exchange rate would yes, but rise. at the same time, uh, but at the same time, you know what will happen is it will be a massive flow of money into Germany, okay. right? And then the German government could cap the Deutsche Mark in the way that the Swiss are doing it by okay. effectively uh, buying a lot of. Other people's currencies. Currency. Yeah. It will be costly for Germany, but Germany will not be destroyed. Yeah. France will be. That right. balance of terror keeps the mouth of the French president, whoever the French president might yeah, be, yeah. Sarkozy, Hollande, Macron. And of course, it gives closed. the German Chancellor a lot of power. Enormous power. But, so, our proposal by creating this program for um, restructuring public debt through the ECB's um, intervention, the pan-European Green New Deal funded by the European Investment Bank. And that means that Germany can never leave the euro anymore, which we, is a great thing. Yeah. But it diminishes the exorbitant power that the Chancellor has over the French President. We need to convince the German Chancellor that the interests of Europeans and of Germany outweigh her need to remain so powerful vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Macron. Yeah. Um, have you got a strategy? Uh, I mean, of course, when, when you talk about all this money for renewable energies and stuff, mm. this is actually, in fact, also taking away money from the, the, the huge companies more to the smaller ones. So uh, in, in these fields, the more innovative ones when it comes to green energy or so. Um, and of course, part of the whole thing is the 
this wave of digitalization. Have you got a strategy on that? Well, this is the great challenge because it's one thing to say we need to create a fund of 500 billion euros a year and it's quite another to manage that fund yeah, where course, the money yeah. goes. This is where we need to be innovative. We have proposed that uh, the European Union creates a green transition agency, the purpose of which will be to um, uh, assess the different proposals from different companies, from the middle stand, from startups, from Siemens, from large companies, and allocate it according to merit. This is, will be this will be an interesting challenge, but it's not a challenge that we have not ex um, experienced before. Remember the Marshall Plan. When the Marshall Plan aid came, a huge amount of money came from the United States, and they set up such a works agency in Paris. Inevitably, inevitably, eventually that became the Organization of Economic Cooperation, the OECD. Mm. So we can do it. We've done it before. Uh, some money will be wasted, there's no doubt about that. But then again, private business wastes money, as we yeah, very well know. Look at Volkswagen and diesel, right? Uh, you have to have failures in order to have successes. I mean, I, I remember just recently, um, Peter Altmaier, our Minister of yeah. Economics, said that the state is a lousy entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be like that. Look at Norway's uh, oil company, which is state-owned and which works Indeed. perfectly. Indeed. And then look at Volkswagen also, you know, private companies yeah. which are managed You horribly. can have failure in, in private both business of and in the state business. And in any case, this is not necessarily, I mean, the, our green transition agency is not going to give the money to a, a public sector company necessarily, it can give the money to startups, yeah. it can give the money to Siemens, right, if they have a good project. Uh, at the moment, business is too scared to invest. And it's a never ending circle because they are scared to invest because they think that if they invest in some product, there will not be enough demand for it, yeah. they will lose money. So they don't invest. There is no demand, and then they, they, their worst so, fears are confirmed. I but mean, if they see that we are going to be even John channeling, was thinking about that. Right. Yeah, so if uh, they uh, see that we channel 500 yeah. billion into investment, then that there will is crowd in private investment. Yeah, and of course it creates the demand. Uh, Indeed, and, and, and it and creates good quality jobs. You see, the tragedy that we have yeah. in, in Germany is that every day good quality jobs are being destroyed by automation and replaced by Uberized jobs you know, mini jobs and all that. And none of the establishment parties have a solution to this. And the reason is because you can't have a solution to that until and unless you take the excess liquidity from Frankfurt and you plunge it into green jobs. Hmm. Um, who, who set up this, this plan except you? Oh, we have... Um, well, this is a very interesting question. We have some excellent economists. Um, for instance, the, the, the economics team includes people like uh, James Galbraith from the University of Texas, uh, Anne Pettifor. He's the son of John Kenneth. Yes, huh? the son yeah. of John Kenneth. Um, Anne Pettifor from, from uh, uh, Br Britain, uh, Mariana Matsukato, uh, Stephanie Kelton, who is the economic advisor of Bernie Sanders. Uh, we have good people, Jeff Sachs from the University of Columbia, uh, and so they also calculated everything but what through. But what, I, what I, we are very proud of is the way we put together our agenda. Our experts, we got together and we issued a questionnaire. Just questions, no answers. What do you think should be done about the banks of Germany and the banks of Greece? What do you think we should done? How should we fund uh, the green transition? A long questionnaire. And we sent it to our 100,000 members across Europe and we got feedback. Then we worked out a plan, a draft of a plan, of an agenda, on the basis of what we collected and our own ideas, and then again sent it to our members. So there was this ping pong, this dialogue between the experts and the members. And that took two years. And during those two years, we were not running in elections. So we are the only party that spent two years working on the program before going to voters and saying, well, this is the program, do you want to vote for it? Okay, um, that's quite a new way, I think, of handling. We're trying to do politics that, in a different way. Uh, yeah. That stuff, but uh, then uh, we, we still have these kind of undemocratic structures in the EU, EU including a parliament which has next to nothing to say. Uh, 
have you got a plan how this could be changed? Yes, but this plan has to be crowdsourced. We have ideas of how to kickstart the democratization of the European Union. Uh, there are things we can do tomorrow morning, you know, just without any change in the, in the rules. When I was in the Eurogroup, for instance, uh, I was astounded by the secrecy. Every discussion was com completely behind closed doors. And you didn't know what was being said in there on your behalf. And I remember... Uh, I was l listening to my colleagues saying extraordinary things, things that they would never dare say in public view. Hmm? Mm. Uh, and I remember one day I was looking up at the ceiling in the, in the room and I saw all these cameras because it's full of cameras and microphones and we all have monitors in front of, front of us w watching each other and our faces, which is really absurd. And I thought if there was a revolutionary in the booth, some electrician, a true revolutionary electrician, she just or she would simply need to flick a switch and connect it to the internet so that people out there, voters, citizens, could see and hear what was being said on their behalf. So here is a very simple idea. Let's begin with full transparency. Live stream all the European Union summits, whether they're Eurogroups, ECOFINS, leader summits, so that citizens, I mean, these people are there because you're paying them to be there to represent you. Why can't they speak in public about what they are saying? You see, it would, this transparency is not a sufficient condition for democracy, but it is a necessary condition. This is the first step. Wasn't, wasn't it Henry Ford who said if people would understand our financial system, you would have the revolution by that tomorrow? Was Jen, that was Galbraith. Oh, is that, that, was, that was John Kenneth Galbraith. Oh, okay, if people okay. understood how finances yeah. worked and banking worked, they would, they would rebel. So that's the first step. The second thing is, Together with our green transition policies and our anti-poverty policies, what we are suggesting is once the mood starts to change and people start looking at Europe as a good thing, as a source of solutions, not just a source of, of, of austerity and problems, uh, we are advocating the commencement of a constitutional assembly process. And the idea is to start at schools. School children are now become very politicized, as you know, and this is a fantastic thing. Start, for instance, asking schools to have a competition amongst the students where they write a 15-page draft of the Constitution of a Democratic European Union. And then, at the same time, you have town hall meetings where citizens, voters, start thinking of what kind of governance do we want? Do, you, do we want a federation? And, it, and if so, will it look like the United States of America would look something like the Federation of, of Germany? The Federal Republic here, or something else, some new ideas. Well, we have ideas. the idea of the European Republic. That's that right. Europe exactly. Uh, so uh, we w propose a constitutional assembly process that eventually leads to a constitutional assembly in 2025 in Brussels to draft and vote for our democratic constitution. Thank you very much, Mr. Bovakis, and um, we hope to have you back here one day. I will come back. Thank If you very you much. Have me. Thank you.